Jerry McKesson has a new book, On the Other Side of Freedom, The Case for Hope, which uh, in some ways reminds me of Studs Terkel, I mean, his last book, which is a, the same argument, but from a very different point of view. You, you have, uh, DeRay, uh, just if you're not familiar, which is probably unlikely, but he's a civil rights activist, community organizer, host of Crooked Media's podcast, Pod Save the People. Fortune Magazine named him number 11 in the world's greatest leaders, Harvard's Black Man of the Year in 2016. Uh, he's with the Black Lives Matter movement, of course, co-founder of Campaign Zero. DeRay, welcome to the program. It's good to be here. It's great to have you with us. So uh, tell us about your middle-of-the-night realization that led you to drive to nine hours to Minneapolis. Yeah, so my brain got killed on August 9th, and uh, on August 16th, I was sitting on my couch, and I was like, I saw what was happening on CNN. That looked like the protesters are wrong. I saw what was happening on Twitter. It looked like the police are wrong. And I was like, I need to go see for myself what's happening. So I went down. I met up with people who were on the ground already, and that changed everything. The second night that I was in St. Louis was the first night that I was tear gassed, and I was like, nobody should ever have to experience this. I'll do whatever I can to make sure. This was around the Michael Brown killing? Yeah, around Michael Brown's death. And I was like, I'll do whatever I can to make sure this never happens. So I quit, and you know, the rest is history. Wow, you've come a long way. You, you've uh, pointed out to me in our conversation before we came on the air, uh, chapter three, it's, a, it's kind of the most autobiographical chapter what are the high points that you'd like to you'd like people to know about Yes, yeah, so in the book, I talk about things that you'd expect, like the police and, and the protests. Uh, but in chapter three, really a deep dive into some of the things that we know now that we just didn't know before. So mm -hmm. we created the first public database of police union contracts and use of force policies in the country. So you think about things like, uh, I don't know if you knew that in California, there's a law that says that any investigation of an officer that lasts more than a year can never result in discipline, regardless of the outcome. Really? It's a wild. law? law, it's the law. Oh my God. In Cleveland, in the police union contract, it says that they destroy police officer discipline disciplinary records every two years. That's wow. nuts. And the law in Maryland says that you can file an anonymous complaint against an officer for everything except brutality. So wow. we did a lot of work to uncover, and these are that's just like the tip of the iceberg. We did a lot of work around the policies and practices that almost guarantee that officers don't be held accountable. And the second part is we did a lot of data work. So, you know, the government can tell you the rainfall in rural Missouri in 1902, but literally can't tell you how many people were killed last year by the police. Yeah. There have been some years where uh, Florida, for instance, has reported zero killings by police. And, like, we know that's not true. So we did a lot of data cleansing to try and figure out what was going on and learned a lot of things. So we know that black people are actually more likely to be unarmed and not threatening uh, than any other race of people in, impacted by police violence. We know that there's no relationship between police violence and community violence. So we learned a lot of things, and that's in chapter three. Yeah, the, the, uh, you, you write one, uh, one in every three people killed by a stranger in this country. It's killed by a police officer. It's killed by a cop. And an additional 50,000 people are hospitalized every year as a result of violence inflicted upon them by police. Yeah, it's wild. So we, one of the recognitions- We're out of control early was that like this is not just a problem in Ferguson and St. Louis it's a problem in the country yeah we have a it, well, I you know I, I wrote an article some time ago about how modern policing in many ways particularly in the south came out of the old slave patrols right and how many of the, uh, the, the essentially the worldview is the, is still a slave patrol worldview in fact I wrote a book about this which won't be out until next spring but uh, you know same thing the, the hidden history of the Second Amendment and how that all came out of the slave patrols as well how do we how do we fix this I think there are a couple of things. One is like a recognition that we can think about safety beyond policing, that there has to be a way that we can keep communities safe that doesn't require people to have guns, it doesn't require people to be arrested and put in cages. The second is as we get to that vision, that bigger vision, it is about at the very least if we have to have the police right now, then they need to be held accountable. So when we looked at all the practices and laws that almost guarantee they won't be held accountable, we're no longer shocked. We're like, it makes total sense that like you're not held accountable. If the investigation lasts more than a year, it can't result in discipline, like that's wild. The second piece, too, or the third piece is, like, how do we start to peel back, like, how mass incarceration became mass? So mm -hmm. you think about, like, uh, tell me something you can buy for $300. You mean right now? Anything. Yeah, a cheap phone? T-Phone. So in Florida, to this day, theft over $300 is a felony, and when you become a felon, you permanently lose the right to vote. It's wild. Yeah. So, like, you think about when you ask most people what's a felon, they're like, oh, kill 10 people, robbed a bank. It's like, nope, imagine, so, like, stealing a cheap phone. phone. Yeah. And, like, you lose right to it forever. That's, like, a wild consequence. And part of this is, like, we should just look at, like, what are the things that we consider crimes and start to reevaluate? Does that actually make sense at scale? Well, well, you know, we arrest more I, people for weed than all violent crimes combined. That's wild. I know. That's crazy. And, that you know, Canada next month is completely legalizing pot all across the country. There we, we, go. we need to be doing that. But that $300 thing, I mean, that 
that's something that should be, I would think, subject to some sort of public pressure. Um, you know, when I was a kid in the 60s, the minimum wage was $1.25 or $1.35 an hour. $600 was six, 500 hours of work. Right. Today, $600 is not 500 hours of work. Exactly. And so it, re it represents a completely different thing. And, you know, not to say that, you know, the threshold should be massively higher than that. In Oklahoma, that. up until 2001, it was $50 was a felony. That's Jeez. wild. You know, like, I probably stolen $50 worth of something by mistake, you know, just like <laughs> forgetting to go to the counter and like all of a sudden, uh, but, but people yeah. forget those things, you know? Yeah. yeah, the institution of policing. You write about the golden age of the bully of white supremacy. Yeah, this moment, so that chapter, the chapter's called The Bully in the Pulpit, and in that chapter, uh, I use the metaphor of the bully to think about, like, what is happening in this current context. Somebody asked me, would I ever uh, meet with Trump? And it was like, you know, I don't, my job isn't to tell the bully that I'm a real person. The bully already knows, right? Like, mm. he already knows that that is real. So that's what that chapter is a meditation on. Uh, I'm also interested in, like, how we start to think about... Um, like some of the things that aren't as sexy around like general inequity. So like, do you know why kids uh, eat paint chips, like lead paint chips? Do you know why? Sweet. Lead it's is sweet. sweet. Did you? How did yeah. you know that? I I grew up in in a house that had lead. And... It's sweet. I had no clue. That's right. So when you I think of, when, when you think about it being sweet, and you think about the period of time in this country where we mandated that the paint and housing projects be lead based paint. Yeah. It's like if I didn't think there was a conspiracy before, I'm like convinced it is now. You know. Yeah. And like, how do we start to peel all of those things back when we think about the work of justice? Yeah, it's it, it's it's big stuff. Tell me, your blue vest has become a logo for you. You you wear it wherever you go. You're in media appearances and things. Tell us about. It. Yeah, I write about it in the book, but it reminds me of you know we were in the street for 400 days. So if you ever start marching, it wasn't that we thought marching was cool. It was that it was illegal to stand still, and we couldn't stand still in August, September, October 2014. If we sit still, you violate the loitering laws, right? No, they made a new rule. It's called the five second rule. So if you sit still oh, for really? more than five seconds, you were arrested. It was like a wild thing. Wow. The police, I think, thought that we were gonna we're going to be tired and go home and instead we're like well if we got to walk all day you got to walk all day and like that's what it, we just walked all day and all night and uh the vest you know i started wearing it when it got cold because we been in the street for a long time and i needed something that i could wear that i never have to pack and today it just reminds me it's like my tattoo you know yeah. it reminds me that what we went through was real i never want to forget how fragile democracy is how easy it was for them to make up a rule being like you can't stand still for more than five seconds like, this is in ferguson this maybe? is in st louis yeah it was like in the st. region louis. but i never want to i never want to forget those things yeah yeah good idea um the the uh distinction between whiteness and white people this concept of whiteness is a social construct that has been turned into a legal construct that has become you know, again, I, going back to the slave patrol thing, this, you know, this idea of weight, speak to that. Yeah, you know, the chapter is called The Choreography of Whiteness and like trying to help people name things. So like we think about white supremacy as the idea that white people are better, more worthy and are normal or like the standard for normal. We think about whiteness as the culture that that has just birthed and how that like it's like a smog, right? It seeps mm -hmm. into everything. And then we think about people like white people as a people who benefit from those things, whether they intentionally perpetuate them or not. Uh, and we think about the recognition of white privilege. It's a, a recognition that like people benefit from something they didn't necessarily work for, uh, but they do benefit at scale and the most important thing that white people can do when they sort of have that recognition of privilege is understand like not only do they benefit at the personal level but there's something at the system level that even like allows that to happen so the chapter sort of deals with like denial and white guilt and shame and like how whiteness sort of manifests as people are trying to work through it how do we uh, this this is a change a fundamental change that has to happen it seems to me in large part within the white community and White people need to be talking to white people about this. Yeah, absolutely. What's the best way to do that? So I think some of it is starting where you are, right? Saying like, here are the issues that I think are important and like saying we should do something about them. Uh, the second is like knowing an issue really well. So one of the things that I find when I travel across the country is that people sort of know top line issues, but they actually like, you're like, they're like, do I want to do something in mass incarceration? You're like, what do you what do you care about with mass incarceration? And they're like mass incarceration, and you're like that's not helpful, right? Like what part that's of the, the bumper sticker? Yeah, like the, the system is very big, so I, there are enough problems that we can actually align the work to like whatever you're interested in, and like people need to be interested. And the third is that what white people can do that people of color just can only do differently is like use the access and the resources to really challenge systems in a way that they just won't push back as hard on you because you're white. So what does it mean? You know, I think about being in Austin when the Austin organizers got the whole city council to vote against the 
police union contract unanimously mm. is that it was actually powerful that there were so many white people who came up and said like this just isn't right right like this is this is a racial justice issue this is also just a, an equity issue this also just isn't fair and they aren't you know in Austin they're not impacted in the same way by the police but they understood that like it meant something important for the city council to say like we care too and we're your constituents so some of it is that it seemed to me for some time uh, for f five maybe ten years now that this disruptive technology of having a camera in every phone and having a phone everywhere uh, brought us all these videos of police killing unarmed black men that just became the, the wallpaper of the last five years or more, but really breaking through into the press. And that this has created a moment, an opportunity, uh, uh, you know, an, an awareness and an awakeness among, um, you know, white people who were not paying attention before right. uh, that, that needs to be exploited. Um, and the awareness is good. You know, the challenge is that the outcomes haven't changed, right? right? So in four years, we have definitely started a national conversation about race and justice in a way that just didn't exist four years ago. Um, the outcomes are still really bad. So the question becomes, how do we make sure that people don't get stuck in the awareness cycle, right? That they're like, oh, I know, this is really bad. Right. Because the question is like, what do we do? And you even think about like Stefan Clark being killed in Sacramento is that what came out of that is people started like a million dollar opportunity fund and like, yes, there should be opportunity. But remember, the lack of opportunity isn't what killed Stefan Clark, right? right? Like it was the police. Yeah. So how do we start to like make sure that the solutions that we put forth like are good solutions for the actual problem that manifested and not like other problems? Yeah, yeah. Politics has become polluted with this. There's been, you know, for some time, you know, progressives, progressive politicians have been talking about the need for addressing racial issues, but it seems like we're way behind on that. Oh, I'm sorry, we're hitting the break here. I, I thought I had another minute. DeRay McKesson, uh, his new book is On the Other Side of Freedom, The Case for Hope. DeRay, thanks so much for being so with us today. good to be here. It's great to meet you. And uh, his pod, Pod Save the People, from Crooked Media. So check it out. DeRay, thank you very much. Great having you.